from high atop Fox News headquarters in New York City. Always seeking solutions, never sowing division. It's Brian Kilmeade. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. It's the Brian Kilmeade Show. Hope you had a great Tuesday. We're back up and ready to fly. Senator Rick Scott coming up shortly, and Rich Lowry at the bottom of the hour from National Review. Senator Rick Scott feeling much more optimistic that the Republicans can, in fact, take the Senate. 538 said at 1.70% chance the Democrats keep it. That number's dropped down to 60%, and I bet you it could drop more, especially after some of the debates that have taken place. Republicans seem to have afforded themselves quite well. If you ever want to uh, catch the podcast, can't catch us live, BrianKillMeetShow.com. Let's get to the big three. Now with the stories you need to know, it's Brian's Big Three. Sponsored by Crunch Fitness. Interested in owning your own business in a growing $30 billion industry? Check out Crunch Fitness at crunch.com. Number three. So we're not considering uh, new releases releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We don't have anything more to share or we're not going to be uh, considering new releases. Yeah, the problem is you did. Uh, that was October 4th. Yesterday, 50 million barrels are barreling into the world market. How irresponsible. Energy idiocy. Top oil reserves stop uh, drilling and offering leases. Blame Putin and Saudi Arabia. Why a refusal to acknowledge fossil fuels is costing all of us uh, and possibly the Democrats majorities in both the House and the Senate. Number two. Go, Go through item after item. You know, you want more criminals on the street? You vote for Fetterman in Pennsylvania. You want to make sure that Biden continues to inflate the economy, you vote for Warnock in Georgia. Newt Gingrich, key race rundown. And what went down in the Florida Senate debate last night? As it becomes clear, almost no race is safe because the American people don't feel secure. We will look at the most compelling races. Number one. The president once told us that inflation was his top domestic priority. Now we are told inflation is his top economic priority as he decides to stake his side's midterm chances on abortion access. Weird. Flailing. That's what it seems Biden is doing and suddenly choosing abortion over inflation, crime and the border as their priority. We will show you what the people say they care about with 20 days to go. So... I'm a little shocked. Almost every poll shows that when you go state by state or even nationally, what people care about among likely voters, for example, what do you think the most important problem is? 26 percent say the economy, 18 percent say inflation, 8 percent say state of the democracy, 5 percent say immigration and 5 percent say abortion. But yet that's what the president's leading with. The theory being that young people care. He needs young people to vote because the older people seem to be running for the hills. And in many ways, uh, who can actually blame them? Um, a couple of things are happening right now. Uh, we are uh, we're trying to find out, number one, what uh, Joe Biden is doing. Was he ad-libbing off the prompter or was uh, was Joe Biden somebody who thinks that abortion is something that people want to hear about? Uh, we'll discuss that um, real quick. If we just bring in the sound, uh, the sound sheet, that would be great. So we know uh, exactly what has to uh, what we have to go over. But let me just also tell you this. Uh, If you look at what people are concerned about in terms of a democracy, the Fox News power rankings is now out. And here is um, and here is what the GOP is projected to take uh, to take a majority of the 232 seats plus 17 right now. The Dems projected to take 203 seats. That's minus 17. Thirty three are still toss ups. But When you look at the Senate races, control of the Senate comes down to we think four races, although more may be in play. Arizona, obviously, uh, uh, he looks like Kelly is just a terrible candidate. Uh, maybe his twin brother's better. Uh, Georgia, Herschel Walker uh, lost a couple of points, but is still within striking distance. His internal say he's up too. Nevada, Adam Laxalt's in front and within the margin of error in Pennsylvania. That will decide really what happens. What I, what I fear could happen is it all comes down to Georgia again, and if you don't get over 50%, In Georgia, you have to have a runoff again. So if you want proof that what the president finally says is uh, his final sprint to the finish will be about abortion, just listen to this yesterday. Cut one. And I've said before, the court got Roe right nearly 50 years ago, and I believe Congress should codify Roe once and for all. Right now, we're short a handful of votes. If you care about the right to choose, then you got to vote. That's why in these midterm elections are so critical. So 
it was October 6th uh, when Corinne Jean-Pierre says inflation was his number one priority and that getting gas prices down was key, but he was not going to tap strategic goal reserve. But guess what? It's not his priority. And now the strategic goal reserve was tapped. And now he says it's abortion. Of all places, CNN is questioning the wisdom of this. Cut five. For President Biden to make good on his pledge to codify Roe, Democrats would have to keep the House majority, pick up Senate seats, and eventually change the filibuster rule as well. That's a very tall order. Is the president setting himself up potentially for failure? Look, what you heard from the president is his continuous fight uh, to fight for millions of women across the country. When we saw what the Supreme Court did in this unconscionable decision to overturn Roe, it put millions of women's lives at risk. She is terrible. Uh, Have you ever thought about answering a question ever? So, I mean, look, uh, good luck with that. So let's blow up the filibuster. If you get a majority, you have this, the presidency, you probably get, you're going to lose the House. So if you have a majority, blow up the Senate with the filibuster. Change it forever, okay? And then ram everything down to everyone's throat. Be as short-sighted as Harry Reid, who blew up the filibuster for judges. And now understand that almost nobody thinks the Republicans are not going to win the House in two years if they don't win it now. Because an overwhelming number of Democratic contended seats are going to be up. So the Republicans will have run of the place. And if you think things are changing a little bit, if you have just the Senate and the presidency, can you imagine what 2024 is going to look like? Especially when you look everywhere you see, uh, almost everybody is doing worse thanks to this president and his policies. It didn't stop Ron Klain from uh, tweeting out. This a uh, short time ago, after four weeks of gas prices, we're now in the second week of decline. In 16 states, it's $3.50. Not in any state I've been in. Uh, gas prices dropped 10 cents or more during the past week alone. So it's still a dollar above what it was. It was at three ninety two for and going up for the last two weeks. So the last couple of days, it's gone down. And he quickly touts that. I don't know about the wisdom of that because it brings more attention to it. Because same thing with the market. When you start touting that the market goes up, you have to understand people are paying attention uh, when it goes down. So we will see uh, where we stand. The other thing, and I don't want to take too much time away uh, on the midterms because I have Senator Rick Scott just around the bend. Uh, there was a big debate last night. Val Demings notes to close that five or six point gap. The former police officer turned congresswoman, Democrat, had to bloody up Marco Rubio. Here's a look at how they sparred on climate change, on abortion, uh, on, uh, on uh, I guess, insurance as well. Cut seven. Every bill I've ever sponsored on abortion, every bill I've ever voted for has exceptions. Senator, how gullible do you really think Florida voters are? You have been clear that you support no exceptions even including rape and incest. The extremist on abortion in this campaign is Congresswoman Demings. She supports no restrictions, no limitations of any kind. Climate change is real. If we don't do something about it, then we're going to pay a terrible price for it. What we cannot do is some of these crazy policies that are coming from the left that Congresswoman Demings has supported. Of course, the senator who has never run anything at all but his mouth would know nothing about helping people and being there for people when they are in trouble. Uh, And if she's referring to illegal immigrants, uh, I think the American people have moved past that. So uh, Rubio said, I want the competition. The one thing about Marco Rubio, he can go deep on almost any policy. I know from interviewing him, he ran for president um, and he took on Jeb Bush and I've seen him in debates before. He knows the issues. So that won't be an issue. Uh, Well, Val Demings has got to say, I'm pro-police. I have to pretend as if I wasn't trying to reimagine policing. I know she was a cop in the past, but she did not come strongly out for law enforcement when everything was going crazy and things were burning. The other area in which there's tremendous hope amongst Republicans is New York. Lee Zeldin's within three points, according to the new Quinnipiac poll, a little bit further back with Siena. But on the average, he's four points back in a very republic, a very democratic state. Why? Because uh, he's only trailing because of New York City winning upstate, winning Long Island. Cut sixteen. 
We see you with the polling now. You're covering it as far as what the issues are that mattered most to, to New Yorkers. They're not getting the leadership from a corrupt governor who is pandering to pro-criminal allies in the state legislature and in her base. Meanwhile, you have Castle's bail and other pro-criminal laws getting passed, and as a result, people getting hurt. You have woke DAs like Alvin Bragg refusing to enforce the law and not supporting our men and women in law enforcement the way they should. So from the issue of crime to the economy, attacks on freedoms and more, even independents and Democrats are saying that this is too much. They want to save New York City. They want to save our state. And they know that they have to break this one party rule. And Kathy Hochul will not get this job done. She's not trying. She's just running out the clock, which I find really offensive. And you should, too, if you're a Democrat. At least try. Go debate. Go defend yourself. Do you think Marco Rubio has got to have multiple debates? I mean, even Warnock and Herschel Walker had at least one debate. Fetterman's running for the hills, too, but he at least agreed to one debate. You have uh, Hochul said, I'll do one on New York one, nowhere else, for one hour. Uh, Let's see if that actually happens. When we come back, Senator Rick Scott, I'm going to break down those four key races and see if it's indeed, uh, if indeed there is more in play. Like, for example, many people are hopeful of Republicans, uh, Don Bolduc in New Hampshire. Is that a bridge too far? What about Blake Masters in Arizona? Is that a bridge too far? Or... Is that a right on the money? Mitch McConnell has pulled money out. Why? Don't move. This is the Brian Kilmeade Show. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. I'm Janice Dean, Fox News Senior Meteorologist. Be sure to subscribe to the Janice Dean Podcast at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And don't forget to spread the sunshine. Precise, personal, powerful. It's America's weather team in the palm of your hands. Get Fox weather updates throughout your busy day, every day. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. The fastest three hours in radio. You're with Brian Kilmeade. What we cannot do is some of these crazy policies that are coming from the left that Congresswoman Demings has supported. You know, she supported a plan to put a, what is a $10.25 tax per barrel of oil. We can't do that kind of crazy stuff. It only adds to the inflation. I think it begins by winning this election and getting people like that out of office. Of course, the senator who has never run anything at all but his mouth would know nothing about helping people and being there for people when they are in trouble. No one planned the pandemic, but our response to it is everything. There is not a single federal law on the books that she sponsored and got passed. Not one. And one thing about Marco Rubio, especially with Donald Trump, uh, he was basically handling uh, Cuba policy and South America policy, and it was his idea And he put together the PPP loans that got people money right away, small businesses that were just told to stand down. Senator Rick Scott's been standing up. Uh, He's in the Senate Homeland Security Committee, Armed Services Committee, and is chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Senator, how do you think it went last night? Very few people know Florida politics better than you. Marco did a great job. Um, I mean, here's what you have to admire about Marco. He shows up. He shows up. He cares. He cares not about just the state of Florida. He cares about this country, and he cares about Latin America. Val Demings, there's nothing she's ever accomplished. I mean, there's no, she's a do-nothing. Um, and she's part of that radical left that votes for every crazy radical idea there is. So Marco did a great job. He's going to have a big win. I'm excited about uh, November. We're going we're gonna to get a majority. We're going to get 52-plus Republican seats. Um, and me think about it. Brian, they always say, oh, Republicans can't win. They've said that every cycle. Uh, and guess what? Now all the pollsters who don't want to be wrong are coming around and saying, well, maybe they've got a shot now. But, of course, we have a shot. We've got, we got great candidates. They're running good races. We're going to win. Uh, well, let's look at some of the races in particular. How much damage was done with the revelations last week with Herschel in the polls? And uh, do you think that uh, he helped heal that with the debate? Well, first off, Herschel's denied it. Right? It's not true. Uh, and so, first off, everybody wants to, this is exactly what they do. Whenever they get behind, they just go smear people. But listen, what's, what's truthful about Warnick? What's truthful about Warnick is he's, he's, he runs the same church as Martin Luther King did. And guess what? They have an apartment complex. They're evicting people for barely bail, five, ten dollars, twenty dollars behind in the rent. That's truthful. It's truthful that he ran over his, he, he's treated his wife like, his ex wife like dirt. 
That's truthful. His wife came on and said that exactly happened, and he's never said he didn't do it. So, so the I mean, Herschel's going to win. Herschel's generally, if you look at the polls, Herschel's generally up three. Um, he, we, we've defined Warnick. He's voted all the time with Chuck Schumer. So here's what this mistake was uh, two years ago. They didn't define Warnick early. So I took over this job January after, the, after we lost in Georgia. I took over, and from day one, I started explaining to people in Georgia who Raphael Warnick is. He votes against Georgia for New York. Whatever Chuck Schumer says, when he says jump, Raphael Warren says, how high should I jump, uh, Mr. Schumer? He does exactly what Chuck Schumer, Chuck Schumer wants him to do. Uh, let's look at Arizona. Kelly is continuing to raise money like a maniac. Uh, he has uh, $75 million as of September 30th and still has $13.2 million in hand. Uh, Blake Masters lost the support of Mitch McConnell's group, it seems, because Peter Thiel is supposed to step in. What could you tell us? Uh, Blake Master is going to win. But it doesn't matter how much Mark Kelly has. Okay, Unfortunately, Mark Kelly's on the wrong side of every issue. He's voted with Chuck Schumer all the time. Arizona is not a far-left state like, like, you know, like the way Chuck Schumer votes. And as people have gotten to know exactly how Mark, Mark Kelly votes, we've started defining, we started defining Mark Kelly last year. He's voted against border security in a state that deals with border security every day. He voted against it three times on the, Senate, on the floor of the Senate. Three times. That's when, as people know, when Mark Kelly is responsible for the crime problems. Mark Kelly is responsible for inflation. Mark Kelly is responsible for, uh, you know, he supports, you know, defunding the police and all that stuff. So as people understand where Mark Kelly is, that's why Blake Master is going to win. We've raised money. We've made big investments there. There's other groups that have come in because and Blake just destroyed Kelly in the debate. So uh, and but and, and Kerry Lake's uh, leading in the governor's race, and so those two together, um, they're going to win. Uh, one pe- thing people say is the Republicans uh, had such a brutal campaign in Pennsylvania, uh, a knockout drag out, three candidates with over thirty percent. They're not convinced the Republicans have rallied, come back together yet. Um, I know it's a two-point race. I've never seen Oz in the lead. What have you done to bring Republicans together in Pennsylvania? Well, first off, there's never been a pulse that I was in the lead either. And all three of my – in all my races, my primary in 10 and my races in 10, 14, 18, they all said I would lose. And most of them pulse that I lose by a long shot. Here's – Oz is running a good race. As people – here's what we've done. We did it. And Oz's team is doing doing it. We've defined Fetterman. Fetterman wants to wants to release criminals. He wants to legalize all the drugs. I mean, he's a guy. If you if you've made a bunch of money, you don't want your kids to turn out like Fetterman. Fetterman's a rich kid that's never done anything. He doesn't know how to do anything, but he's so radical. And that's not what Pennsylvania is. So Oz is going to win because Oz is a thoughtful candidate. He's working his tail off. They've got a good state party there. And people are going to come out and vote for Oz, and they're not going to vote for uh, for Fetterman. I was up there the other day. Um, there's there's a lot of, you know, Jeff Bartos has busted his butt. He lost in the primary to Oz, but he went on. He came on Oz's team immediately and said, we're going to get this party together, and we're going to win. We've got a good state party there. Oz is traveling the state. He's going to win. Well, uh, here is John Fetterman. Let's listen to this. Cut 19. I believe in redemption, and I would just ask anyone watching, I would say if you've seen Shaw, uh, Shawshank Redemption, the movie, it's all a choice on redemption and in giving somebody a chance to not die in prison that is no of any danger to the public whatsoever. Do you like that analogy? <laughs> well, first off, I did clemency cases. I did 100 clemency cases every three months when I was governor. You turn your life around and you can prove you turned your life around. I'm open to, to talking to you. But what he wants to do is just release criminals. Gotcha. I mean, Fetterman just wants to release criminals. Senator Rick Scott, all pumped up, says Dr. Oz will win in Pennsylvania. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. I'm Ben Domenech, Fox News contributor and editor of the Transom.com daily newsletter. And I'm inviting you to join a conversation every week. It's the Ben Domenech Podcast. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. In these ever-changing times, you can rely on Fox News for hourly updates for the very latest news and information on your time. Listen and download now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. The talk show that's getting you talking. You're with Brian Kilmeade. 
The history of this country has always been tied to welcoming those who are fleeing harm. And that is the spirit of this country. It must be done in an organized way. And I, I believe that we will always be responsible as, as New Yorkers to make sure whoever comes here, we're going to do our job. And that's what we have done. I think that New York has been a role model on how to effectively use our infrastructure to address the crisis and make sure we treat people in a humane way. And that's what we have done. Mayor Eric Adams, absolutely tone deaf. This guy sent up a tent city. I know he's he's got to deal with 20,000 illegal immigrants, no help from his New York governor, but he's got now 19,000 illegal immigrants in 400-hour night hotels in shelter systems, and now he built a tent city in Randall's Island where, for the most part, fire to fighters train and kids play sports. And he set it up in a way that you're not going to believe. There's over 500 beds. You get three meals a day. You uh, get a laundry service. So all you have to do is hand in a laundry bag. They will fold your laundry as well as an Xbox and a game room. Rich Lowry, the editor of National Review. Rich, is that the way you handle legal immigration? <laughs> well, you know, I have no use for Eric Adams. <clears throat> I think he's been hypocritical throughout this whole thing. But – there's no good answer when you have uh, hundreds of thousands of people just swarming into the country. They have to go somewhere. They have to be accommodated somewhere. Maybe this isn't the best way to do it in, in New York, but in Washington, D.C., they just have random tents all over the place, you know, like mushrooms. Same in as New Orleans. single public space, yeah. So the answer, obviously, is to – Stop it at the source. Stop it at the border. The Biden administration, obviously, despite taking political hits, despite this this uh, being a, a really visible failure now all over the country, is just not going to do it. You know, he's beholden to an ideology and a bunch of activists who just think we basically have no right to control our border, and this is the way it should work. You come in with a bogus asylum claim, and you get to stay. And maybe, maybe, you know, cross your fingers if we're lucky, you're expelled at some point, but that's never going to happen. You know, the the number of people who get expelled is really small. And everyone knows, you know, the, the word that uh, it, uh, it spreads everywhere. You know, I was in Guatemala three months ago, and now I'm in a tent city in Randall's Island with three meals a day and free laundry service. And that's just a, an extra incentive for more, even more people to come. And what about the uh, messaging? Oh, we are have a country that takes in people who are refugees or under siege. That's not these people. There are some that may qualify. You do it at a consulate. You do it through immigration. You don't do it this way. And believe yep. me, they're saying, Mike, this country is better than my country, so I think I'll move for free yeah. and get yeah, full so, accommodations. Uh, yeah, if they have legitimate asylum claims, we have laws about that. It should be adjudicated, and if they have a claim, they should come in – a legitimate claim, they should come into the country. But they shouldn't come in the country based on bogus claims and stay forever even if their claims are rejected, and that's what the Remain in Mexico is about. You stay in Mexico while it's adjudicated. If it's legit, come on in. If it's not – Go home, and you know there's there was New York Magazine did a big interview uh, with one of these um, migrants who who ended up at Martha's Vineyard, and he was he was just he was honest. You know, I came from Venezuela and I, I wanted a better job, and he he walked through you know five or six other countries where if he had fear of persecution, he could have stayed at any of those countries. That's the way you know it works in, in most of the world. You're, you're supposed to once you're in a country where you're safe and you're a refugee, you stay there. But obviously, he came to the United States to to get a better better job, and who can blame him? Because we're we're letting him in and giving them better jobs, and uh, you know ended up temporarily at Martha's Vineyard, was supposed to be you know pull, pull our heartstrings, but he, he's you know. For all we know, he's in Randall's Island now. <laughs> right. So, yeah, and that's where he's going to be. And you know they're going to get stir crazy. And we don't know the quality of these individuals. And were they going to be walking around parks watching kids, eight-year-old kids play soccer? Uh, that's going to be a healthy mix, isn't it? Uh, we, we know one thing. We don't see any police officers anywhere, so I'm sure they're not going to be there. Rich Lowry with us, National Review. Rich, I think the red wave is reprimed, and part of the reason yep. is – because of the performance of this administration and their policies. Tell me what's behind this pivot. It's to abortion when all indications are Democrats don't list that as a top five issue. Cut to. The anger, the worry, the disbelief, the unbelievable fact that for the first time in our history, the Supreme Court didn't just fail to preserve a constitutional freedom, it actually took away the right that was so fundamental to Americans. Right. So he, so what he wants to do is first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the filibuster and codify Roe as we keep the yep. Senate. 
So while I'm looking at this poll, and I asked Democrats, Democrats, likely voters, what do you care about? 17% the economy, including jobs. 17% inflation. 11% state of democracy. 8% abortion. So why is this guy, why is the president leading with that? Because he's desperate to try to make more people care about it again and get it back up to where it was in in August when it really seemed to be um, really sucking the momentum out of the the Republican uh, red red wave. But now it's it's clearly a second-tier issue. Even among second-tier issues, it's been eclipsed by crime. And part of what happened here, one, the economy just reasserted itself. It was always going to be the biggest issue, but it's gotten even bigger the last couple months. And Republicans adjusted. So, you know, you have Herschel saying, look, I I favor the heartbeat bill. And my my opponent is the extremist because he favors abortion all nine months. J.D. Vance, I think J.D. is in in favor of the 15-week ban. Same thing. But you, you, Tim Ryan, you favored all nine months. So that's a much better position to be in. So Republicans have found their footing. Um, So it's a combination of those two things, economy overwhelming, Republicans finding their footing, and um, they're desperate desperate to kind of relive the glory of of August. But it's, it's not it's not it's not coming back it's not coming back the next three weeks certainly well i mean i want you to hear what's going on in pennsylvania i've never seen dr oz leading in a poll but fetterman's obviously health challenges and his left-wing philosophy plays right into dr oz's uh, power uh, power source because he's a conservative and he did if he can get republicans consolidated around him the the choice is so stark that he puts you you would think he might deliver victory here he is yesterday cut 18 we have to stop the loss of cops. There's a dramatic increase in early retirements of police just leaving the force. They're having trouble recruiting new officers. The coddling of criminals, which is vogue now amongst the far left radical elements. But I'm going to put my surgeon's cap back on and describe something that we do in, in surgery that I think would be beneficial to our society. We let people do their jobs. The anesthesiologist puts the patient to sleep because they know what they're doing. The scrub nurse picks out the instruments so they're ready and hands them to the surgeons who then make the appropriate incisions. You do your job, you work together. I'm a pragmatic, balanced leader. I will reach across the aisle and make sure that we all are aligned in exactly what we want to do, which is to keep our community safe. So he talks about coming together. He talks about a method, gives an idea of his background. And uh, instead of focusing on 12 mansions, which he may or may not have, focus on how he got there. The guy's a self-made mm-hmm. surgeon who became a TV star and got rich. Why do we resent him? But I, li- I like that delivery. Do you? Yeah, look, I mean, there, there's a reason why this guy was a TV star, right? He's, yeah. he's a good communicator, and he's, he stumbled out of the gate, one, a, a divisive primary, um, two, conservative yeah. Republicans, yeah. Trump voters w- d- didn't know who he was and weren't sure why they're supposed to be supporting him, three, didn't have the money initially, and Fetterman was, was dominating the airwaves, but he's, he's found his footing, um, he's doing the work, uh, his campaign staff is quite good, this is now a toss-up race, went from a double-digit uh, deficit to a, a toss-up race. And, you know, that, that message, that, that doesn't get me, you know, uh, jumping, what we just heard, jumping up and applauding, right? It's, it's not a conservative red meat message. But if you're going to win in a bluish, you know, purplish state, that's, that's the kind of message you, you, you want. I'm a conservative, but I'm a pragmatist. So uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if Oz, Oz pulls that one out. So I see a tweet from Ron Klain, the chief of staff, saying, look, gas prices are going down over the last couple of days. And the president yesterday, uh, I think made his press secretary and his whole staff look bad when they decide to go back into the strategic oil reserve, mm-hmm. uh, which is there, there for an emergency to play politics. Why would that help? Yep. Because he doesn't want to drill. It would upset his left. But it's not in our national interest uh, to worry about politics. We should be doing it. And number two, it gets the price down. So he's attacking it. Uh, so for the most part, you have a guy that one week ago had a press secretary Uh, come out and say this, cut 25. So we're not considering uh, new releases releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, beyond the 180 million, which is what you're talk, speaking about, about the 1 million, uh, that the president announced months ago. We, we don't have anything more to share or we're not going to be uh, considering new releases. October 4th. Now, either she doesn't go to meetings, they don't even brief her, she hasn't made the effort to understand, or they don't care enough to even inform her and not make her look stupid. It's, that's a hard job. I don't care who you are. But you've got to be informed. Now all of a sudden she looks ridiculous October 17th. 
Yeah, well, it, that's not a new phenomenon that she looks ridiculous. I mean, she she is just not. It's a tough job, especially in this administration with these circumstances. But it, she she is not cover cover herself in glory. And this is it's appalling, you know, that they're they're drawing down the strategic reserve entirely for partisan political reasons, just the way they were lobbying the Saudis at the end, entirely for political reasons to put off by a month. You know, what difference does that make except for the the political calendar? They're um, they're they're cracked down on their production. Yep. So this shows desperation. And look, you know, the, the price of, of gas going down a couple days just does not – it doesn't make a difference. You know, it's still higher than it was in, in mid-September. It's still higher than it was a, a year ago. So uh, I understand their desperation. Again, it's a common theme as we were talking about with abortion as well, but it's, mm. it's not going to work for them. So biggest uh, – uh, we've got four big races. you got Georgia. You have Nevada. You have uh, you have uh, I wouldn't even say Colorado anymore, but um, we have the obvious ones that are contentious. You have Pennsylvania, you have Georgia, you have Arizona. I get it. Now, when you look at what's happening in the Senate race in uh, Oregon, when you look at what's happening in Colorado, when you look at what's happening in New Hampshire, do you see any hope for Republicans there? You know, there could be a surprise if it's a, if it's a big night. There usually is. Maybe you know. I think I think um, I think Masters has a, a shot in Arizona more than I would have thought a couple of weeks ago. And I think uh, of those kind of stretch stretch. You know, or- Oregon, Ohio, um, Colorado, New Hampshire. Probably New Hampshire's most likely. Baldo. But um, we haven't seen. Yeah, we haven't seen much of it in in the polls. But I, I think Republican oper- operatives kind of target that as as maybe the the next the next one in the outer band of um, doable races. But you know, the four we focused on, Ron Johnson is looking real good in Wisconsin. Republicans feel very confident about Nevada, as we just talked about. And then you got Herschel. And I don't think there's any way Warnock's getting to 50. You have to get to 50 to avoid a runoff. Um, so I think that one, one way or the other, even if Herschel's leading, is probably going to a runoff. And, and Herschel helped himself a lot in that debate last week. Whoever uh, prepped him uh, did a fantastic job, and then then he stood and, and delivered, especially on abortion. I mean, he just wiped the floor with Warnock. You know, it's interesting. He did this Reagan thing. Reagan put a bunch of issues in a hat, and he would be quizzed on it constantly when he was campaigning in 76 and 80. And Herschel read that and was doing it. And I oh, saw the hat. with. So that was back oh, really? uh, seven oh, weeks ago. So he does, he does understand the issues. One thing I just think is a joke, and uh, they keep on saying he's not intelligent. I think it's just totally wrong. The guy never stops reading, uh, extremely religious, so it's, it, that's very authentic. Yeah, but, there's also a little uh, a, a little kind of um, uh, accent and, and way of speaking bias there because, you know, you're, know, you're a northerner, and, and you turn on that debate, and you're like, well, why does he sound this? this, this what, what kind of yokel is this guy? You know, but that's, that's the way a lot of people talk, and it doesn't mean they're, doesn't mean they're stupid. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the, to me, the most talented politician to emerge out of nowhere is Kari Lake. Oh, yeah. oh, unbelievable. I, 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 I thought she was a suicide she candidate. I, I don't like her. You know, she's not, not my type of Republican. But holy cow, it just shows the uh, the power of ha- having TV skills and communication skills and having a, a profile, which she does, and then just taking no BS. So she's very likely going to win that race. And if, if Blake Masters wins, it's going to be because of her. It's going to be because of her coattails, which is just shocking. It is. And it's, it's almost they say it's a dead heat. But when her opponent refused to, I think Katie Hobbs, when she refused to debate yep. because she said the other woman, ta- uh, Carrie Lake, talks too much, I go, okay, uh, you're done. You're afraid. <laughs> well, yeah, it also helps to run against a, a bad candidate. So Lake has that benefit going for her, too. Rich Larry, thanks so much. National Review. Hey, thanks, Brian. He's the editor. Uh, meanwhile, when we come back, I'll take your calls, one 408 Giving you everything you need to know. You're with Brian Kilmeade. Hey, it's Will Kane, co-host of Fox & Friends Weekend. Join me as I share my thoughts on a wide range of topics, from sports and pop culture to politics and business. The Will Kane Podcast. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com. He's so busy, he'll make your head spin. It's Brian Kilmeade. So we've known all along that Mr. Danchenko was innocent. Um, we're happy now that the American public knows that as well. 
Um, we thank these jurors for their hard work and deliberation and reaching the right result. And that's all we have at this time. So you look at what happened to the John Durham trial. It looks as though uh, uh, Deshenko got off. And it looks as though Michael Sussman got off over the last, I guess, five months in which they were brought to trial. But the revelations that Durham brought forward, I thought, are really substantial. And they back up exactly what President Trump was saying, that his campaign was spied on. And then his presidency was hindered, hindered because the FBI could not believe this guy won and would do everything, it seems, to go out of their way to make sure that he would not do well. Why? You launch an investigation of a Russian collusion that never happened. And how was it done? Well, part of it was this dossier used to follow different members of the Trump campaign. What's in the dossier? Well, what was unwound over the last five months, which has come up in different areas, but definitely in this trial, is the dossier was a collection of hearsay picked up by a Clinton operative who had connections inside Russia, given to Dushenko. Dushenko gives it to Christopher Steele, who puts together this crosstalk and hearsay into a dossier that he says claims that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin have this uh, elaborate deal. The problem, it's all fiction. How do I know? Why do you why should you believe me? Believe Christopher Steele, believe the FBI, because after they got it, they realized they couldn't verify it. They went back to the author and they said, verify it. And they said, I really can't because I didn't go to Russia. Well, and talk to your sources. They talked to Dushenko. Dushenko goes, I told you not to put that in the dossier. I didn't tell you it was true. I'm telling you what I heard. And guess who told him? Two separate sources, one of which was Charles Dolan, a longtime Clinton aide. Really? So think about the idiocy here. All this stuff comes out, and essentially Dushenko was charged with was charged with lying to the FBI. Now, the thing that hindered this case being a conviction, and in my humble opinion, a conviction would be a sidebar story. The thing that Changed my view that this uh, one time the conviction really didn't matter as long as the revelations were verified is the FBI didn't want to prosecute lying to the FBI. The FBI said we kind of used Dushenko as a source, as a Russian source. And if he was to go to jail and go away, we'd be hurt by that. So wait a second. If you lie to the FBI like Papadopoulos was accused of, you go to jail. You don't be candid about contributing to uh, uh, working overseas for a foreign government, you go to solitary confinement like Manafort. You just, you get fired like Michael Flynn for taking a call from Russia as a future national security advisor. But if you're with the investigation of Donald Trump about a collusion that turns out never happened, you get prosecuted, but you don't get convicted. So I don't think Durham was a fail. I think people got to read his report. They want to ignore it. It shows how poisoned the FBI is, and it'll come out, especially if the Republicans get the Senate. Ron Johnson and uh, Grassley will bring those whistleblowers forward, maybe clean up the agency for good. For good. Brian Kilmeade Show. News Radio Studios in Midtown Manhattan. It's the fastest growing radio talk show. Brian Kilmeade. Yes, and from 48th and 6th in Midtown Manhattan, heard around the country, heard around the world, this is finally the latest edition of the Brian Kilmeade Show. Uh, bottom of the hour, Jason Chaffetz brings inside the horse race to have the balance of power. Does it shift in the House? Does it shift in the Senate? Jason Chaffetz has been doing some work, especially a, a heated race or a place he used to call home and represent Utah. Uh, Katrina Camp is going to be with us, too. Fox News' uh, newest host. Uh, of Mansion Global on FBN. It starts tonight at 8 o'clock. So cool. They visit some of the richest places around. She also is a real estate expert. Many of you thinking about moving. Many of you thinking about selling. And now you see 7% uh, interest rate, and you're thinking, maybe I should hold on to my cards here. Let's get to the big three. 
Now with the stories you need to know, it's Brian's Big Three. Number three. So we're not considering uh, new releases releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We don't have anything more to share or we're not going to be uh, considering new releases. Really? But you are, and that's been announced. That was last week, and that's now. Energy idiocy. We are going to tap all oil reserves. We are going to stop drilling. We are not offering leases. Blame Putin, blame Saudi Arabia is the method and the practice of this administration. Why a refusal to acknowledge that fossil fuel fuels this country is costing all of us and possibly dem majorities in the House and Senate. Number two. Go, go through item after item. You know, you want more criminals on the street? You vote for Fetterman in Pennsylvania. You want to make sure that Biden continues to inflate the economy? You vote for Warnock in Georgia. Yeah, that is Newt Gingrich this morning, uh, last night with Laura. Uh, key race rundown, and that's what went down in Florida Senate debate last night. It was heated between Demings and Rubio. Uh, becomes clear now, almost no race is safe on either side because the American people don't feel secure personally and economically. We're going to look at the most compelling races. Number one. The president once told us that inflation was his top domestic priority. Now we are told inflation is his top economic priority as he decides to stake his side's midterm chances on abortion access. That is uh, Peter Ducey uh, wrapping up an odd press conference, flailing. That's what it seems like the Biden administration is doing and suddenly choosing abortion over inflation, crime and the border as their priority. We will show you what the people say they care about with the 20 days until Election Day. Uh, All right. So let's talk about that. The president of the United States yesterday kind of shocked me when he had this tone on his priority. Cut one. And I've said before, the court got Roe right nearly 50 years ago, and I believe Congress should codify Roe once and for all. Right now... We're short a handful of votes. If you care about the right to choose, then you got to vote. That's why in these midterm elections are so critical. That's why he went to Howard University and tried to get them to vote. He's younger. Uh, They're younger. And Democrats desperately need the young vote to emerge. But the problem is there are a lot of hurdles to this. And number one, on almost all uh, uh, surveys, including ones of likely voters who are Democrats, it is fourth or fifth. Listen to Wolf Blitzer on CNN. Cut five. For President Biden to make good on his pledge to codify Roe, Democrats would have to keep the House majority, pick up Senate seats, and eventually change the filibuster rule as well. That's a very tall order. Is the president setting himself up potentially for failure? Look, what you heard from the president is his continuous fight uh, to fight for millions of women across the country. When we saw what the Supreme Court did in this unconscionable decision to overturn. I can't even listen to it. She, She has no answer. She was actually left out to dry by the administration. Because in she what she said earlier, just one week ago, was something totally different when asked directly about this same exact topic. It's totally irresponsible to tax emergency oil reserves for your political gain to get the price of oil and gas down. Listen to when she was asked this on October 4th, cut 25. So we're not considering uh, new releases releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, beyond the 180 million, which is what you're talk, speaking about, about the 1 million uh, that the president announced months ago. We, we don't have anything more to share or we're not going to be uh, considering new releases. Yeah, but the problem is uh, they did. Uh, They have decided to tap in and get 15 million uh, barrels of oil out. They say they'll not replenish it until it drops to about $70 a barrel. So now we uh, we are down 184.7 million barrels. That is not great security and terrible leadership. With us now in studio, if you're watching Fox Nation, you see her and get ready to watch it tonight at 8 on FBN. Katrina Campins, congratulations on your brand new gig, host of Mansion Global. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. So this is not only do you get a chance to see these mansions, but you love real estate. I mean, that's your thing, right? It's my thing. I've been selling real estate since I was 18 years old. So it's been my thing for a very long time. And I love the fact that now I get to take people inside. Everybody has a guilty pleasure watching real estate shows. I I, I love it. Right? Yeah. I mean, I never thought I would like these real estate shows as much as I did. Uh, The rehab shows to see how people do it. All of construction. And then I like seeing things that I can't afford. It's, it's aspirational. I, you get a lot of ideas. I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time, but I have to say I got so many neat ideas through this process. We 
filmed 40 houses. So you could imagine. I got right. ideas left and right. So many ideas. I don't know what to do with them now. You know, but, but it's, it's good when you're renovating a home. So what is the approach of Mansion Global? The approach is basically we went to areas where people have migrated since the pandemic. People want a better quality of life. They have a lot of we have a lot Texas of Texas and Florida, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Jackson Hole, Montana. Wow. Um, we actually went to Connecticut as well. And what you're noticing is a lot of multi-generational living, right, where you have your your parents living, if you like them <laughs> close by, not too close. But, you know, and then you just have space for everybody to really enjoy life. Is that a change? Yes. A, a tremendous change. And I think it's actually, it, it reminds me of the way my parents grew up in Cuba because my parents, you know, came here during the Castro regime is my mom tells me that the whole family lived together, right? They valued family. They all helped each other because let's be honest, when you have children, it takes a village to raise the, kid, right. the kids. What year did they come? What year did they come? They came during the Castro regime. My mom is 67 now and my dad's about 10 years older and they fled there and, you know, lost everything. And that's where my really my – I just value hard work, right. you know, because they worked really hard for the American dream. You know, I, was, I went to Home Depot two days ago, and I walked in, and this woman says to me, she's helped me out with an order I had that took six weeks where it should have taken one. They said, well, that's the story. I'm not complaining. And she just said, yeah, I got to uh, – you're going to be my last customer. I go, why? She goes, because I cut hair at night. I go, why? She goes, well, with inflation, I got to do something else. This is my extra job. I'm a hairstylist, but I was down to, I had to do this. And when I realized when the pandemic ended, I had to keep this job. She goes, we all used to do that. Grab an extra job, whatever it took. Little Havana to me is fascinating. I did a feature for her for Fox Nation. And they talked about doctors and lawyers coming over here and cleaning houses and becoming construction. Mm -hmm. They said, because I need to make a living. They weren't hiring new doctors that didn't speak English. So I did it. And we all helped each other out. And they say Little Havana is the most successful immigration story since the Pilgrims. It's really amazing because my grandmother came here as a widow with three young girls. And she worked at a factory and she made 25 cents an hour. My dad washed dishes at the Fountain Blue. And they came from very wealthy backgrounds, but everything was stripped of them. So can you imagine being a widow coming here with Tough. three young girls? knowing? You know, I mean, they lived in a one-bedroom apartment. And they drove me by that apartment just to show me, like, this is where – you know, this is what we had to endure in order for you to achieve the American dream. I'm the first person in my in my family to graduate from college. So that's why I got a 4.0 because I was really I wanted to make sure that I took full advantage of it. I paid for my own education. You know, I worked really hard. Um, and I think that work ethic is really the American dream. You know, it's the roots of this country. No, I hear you. And when it comes to real estate, not a great time. It doesn't seem to buy. Yeah, because doesn't. if you're if you have a house. And you're paying a 3% mortgage or 2.8, why would you go get another house, even if you're financially ready, if you're going to pay an interest rate of 7 unless you have cash, correct? I agree with you. It doesn't make sense for sellers to sell right now, which is why in the spring and the summer, we saw an influx of more existing homes on the market. But then as rates continue to rise, as the Fed attempts to really fight inflation, what's the incentive for sellers to move? I know I wouldn't want to move. I have a 3.25 mortgage locked in, right? So why am I going to now buy another property and pay 7, 8%? It doesn't make sense. And so I think we're going to begin to see, and supply is the main factor in this market right now. That's different than 2008 when people compare it. We don't have supply, which I think is really going to help us when it comes to prices dropping tremendously when markets where the supply is lacking. With that said, the West is definitely suffering and we We've already begun to see that correction. Why is that? Because, you know, I think that the appreciation that we saw the past three years is not sustainable. You know, everybody said to me, you've been selling real estate for so long. This must be the happiest time. And these past three years were not. I felt stressed, anxiety. I felt like my buyers didn't have the opportunity because I was fighting against so many bids. People were paying cash. I also, you were competing against Wall Street. First time homeowners were competing against Wall Street. Over the list price. I mean, over the list price. And, and and by the way, sellers were cocky. You know, with all due respect, some of them would say to me, well, I don't have to give you any concessions, your buyer any concessions, you know? And so, I mean, the roof is in major in need of repair and they just wouldn't budge. So I think ultimately life is about balance and things need to be fair. And I, and I hope that there's going to be a, a better opportunity for buyers moving forward. Although into 2023, I do still think that we're going to see more of a correction. Now, if somebody's out there and they say to themselves, I do have cash on the sideline, I'm worried about the market. Is this a good time to buy if you don't need a mortgage? 
Well, a lot of cash buyers did enter the market in the past few years, and I would wait to see what happens because a lot of builders have inventory in the pipeline, and they've actually now begun to pitch that to investors in bulk, which I think is very indicative. They've realized, okay, we can't sell this to the end user as much anymore. We have a lot in the pipeline. They started to build because millennials entered the 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 you know the buying home buy, home buying market. So I would wait for the right opportunity and then yes, and then turn them into rentals because I think passive income is critical and I think more young people should actually buy property um, and turn them into rentals. And what are the areas that are hottest? I know in a country this size, but some area in which might be investing or where you would have no problem renting. Florida. I mean, I know I keep on bringing up Florida. Of course, I was born and raised there, but there's still pockets in Florida where you can tell because Airbnb is doing very well. You know, those that model is doing very well. Tennessee, we visited Nashville, Tennessee. We filmed there and that area is doing very well. Texas, um, Montana, Idaho. I was impressed by Idaho. Never been there. Yeah, amazing. I mean, you're literally driving and you see all of these the, just the greenery, the animals, and you think to yourself, wow, this is this real. Could work. Yeah, this could work. <laughs> yeah. So what can we expect tonight in your first episode? So our first episode starts in Coconut Grove, Florida, which is where I started my entire career at the age of 17. And mm-hmm. we are featuring an amazing property um, on a corner lot. And Coconut Grove is very different than Miami Beach, right? Because you have more family living and you have a lot of executives that have relocated there. And then we also have, we actually went to Beverly Hills. So even though people are fleeing from California, we went to Beverly Hills, and I'll tell you why, because this house was very unique and because of the views. So there still is beautiful architecture there. And then we have beach homes. Right. The beach is my is my favorite place. Are you so, viewing or selling? Am I what? Are you viewing them or just se- are you selling any of these? So we sale? interview agents. Um, I'm actually hosting the show and I'm interviewing the agents and sometimes the owners of the properties who are well-to-do people um, and public figures. And so you're, I'm asking them, like, how did you achieve the American dream? What are you passionate about? What charities are, you know, are dear to your soul? And then the realtors, like, what makes this house um, wow. unique? So. Nice. Uh, I look forward to it. Uh, Katrina Campins, uh, Fox News' newest host on the FBN, the fastest growing channel in all of cable. Mansion Global tonight at 8 o'clock. We'll see it every Wednesday. Thank you so much for having me. It's great meeting you. you. All right. Thank you. And thanks for the great insight, too, along the way. Meanwhile, when we come back, your turn, 1-866-408-7669. And then we'll welcome in Jason Chaffetz, and we'll expand on the big debate last night. It was fiery between Demings and Rubio. Don't move. Brian Kilmeade Show. Learning something new every day on the Brian Kilmeade Show. Information you want. Truth you demand. This is the Brian Kilmeade Show. I'm 100% pro-life. because I, Not because I want to deny anyone the rights, but because I believe that innocent human life is worthy of the protection of our laws. That said, every bill I've ever sponsored on abortion, every bill I've ever voted for, has exceptions. Every one of them does, because that's what can pass, and that's what the majority of people support. Now, what was before us today in Congress that you talk about Lindsey Graham's bill, that's a four-month ban. Okay, that is more lenient than every country in Europe, except for two. So they were debating abortion heavily uh, because one thing Rubio has made clear before the debate and before he really kicked into gear with this uh, reelection campaign. Is that uh, he said, listen, I'm pro-life, but Florida isn't. So I'm, I'm, I'm content with leaving everything where it is. So if you're a Democrat, what do you want to do? You want him to say pro-life, you're for an all-out ban, and if you have an opportunity, would you do that? So that was, that's what they were going back and forth against. Climate change, too. They say Miami's going to be underwater. Uh, then they point out the fact that hurricanes have not been as prevalent in Florida, even though this last one was devastating. And they have not been stronger, even though this one was extremely strong. Uh, here's Val Demings going off on Rubio when it comes to, uh, when it comes to abortion. Cut 10. Senator, how gullible do you really think Florida voters are? Number one, you have been clear that you support no exceptions, even including rape and incest. Now, as a police detective who investigated cases of rape and incest, no, Senator, I don't think it's okay for a 10-year-old girl to be raped and have to carry the seed of her rapist. No, I don't think it's okay for you 
to make decisions for women and girls. As a senator, I think those decisions are made between the woman, her family, her daughter, and her faith. Right. Uh, and by the way, I got just got this uh, text message, this email in. Uh, you can write me at BrianKillMe.com. Uh, most people in Florida don't know a Val is a bully. She and her husband, former Orange County Sheriff, now mayor, aspire to be the next Obamas. Nobody talks about how many gun stores are robbed and how many long guns were stolen from police cars under her. But Marco needs to call her out. Her service weapon was stolen from her. Her car parked in front of her home in a gated community. She'd have been should have been fired. And Rick Scott should have known. That's interesting. Did not know any of that. We'll look to see if that is, in fact, true. The other big issue is climate change. Cut seven. Every bill I've ever sponsored on abortion, every bill I've ever voted for, has exceptions. Senator, how gullible do you really think Florida voters are? You have been clear that you support no exceptions, even including rape and incest. The extremist on abortion in this campaign is Congresswoman Demings. She supports no restrictions, no limitations of any kind. Climate change is real. If we don't do something about it, then we're going to pay a terrible price for it. What we cannot do is some of these crazy policies that are coming from the left that Congresswoman Demings has supported. Of course, the senator who has never run anything at all but his mouth would know nothing about helping people and being there for people when they are in trouble. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure when people are in trouble and helping people. I'm pretty sure that's not an issue. But look, they're, make, they're looking to make headlines. She's trailing between by four and six points. She's got to make up the difference. I question her timing. I mean, she's got to fight. She's a strong Democrat for an open seat. But this is a very popular politician in Florida who starred in the state house. Was uh, was really mentored by Jeb Bush, who was a popular two term governor. And then when he emerged as a Senate candidate, he won easily. Then he won again. Then he ran for president. And then he said, I think I want six more years. And now that's where we're at. Uh, and also, he worked extremely well on foreign policy, too. I don't see any way that Demings wins. It doesn't mean she's not a strong candidate for Democrats. Brian Kilmeade Show. From his mouth to your ears, it's Brian Kilmeade. We see it with the polling now. You're covering it as far as what the issues are that mattered most to to New Yorkers. They're not getting the leadership from a corrupt governor who is pandering to pro-criminal allies in the state legislature and in her base. Meanwhile, you have Castle's bail and other pro-criminal laws getting passed. And as a result, people getting hurt. You have woke DAs like Alvin Bragg refusing to enforce the law and not supporting our men and women in law enforcement the way they should. So from the issue of crime to the economy, attacks on freedoms and more, even independents and Democrats are saying that this is too much. They want to save New York City. They want to save our state. And they know that they have to break this one party rule. And Kathy Hochul will not get this job done. Uh, and she hasn't. And she's been invisible. Uh, the only place that Lee Zeldin is losing, in, and it's he's got 36 percent of the vote, is New York City. He's winning slightly upstate New York and in Long Island. Jason Chaffetz used to work with him. He's a Fox News contributor now with us, he's former chairman of the House Oversight Committee. Jason, do you do you see this as a as a race that's still winnable for for Lee Zeldin? Yes, I, I do. I, first of all, Lee Zeldin is an exceptional candidate. He was in the state Senate. He served the United States Congress. He's a proven uh, a commodity there in New York. People know him. Um, and I think a lot of New Yorkers, even though they may be left leaning, they may be on the Democratic side of the ticket. I think they understand that maybe a little balance up in the state house might do the state good. And even the most, uh, you know, the people that are far, con- far less conservative than I am, I think they understand that crime is destroying their their city, that taxes are driving people out and away from the the state, and that uh, Ali Zeldin will find a, a better balance and uh, and and that two party rule may be better for the state of New York. We'll see. I, I mean, Cuomo's just run over everybody. Pataki shocked his dad and then held on to him for three terms. But we've gone way left here in New York since. You know that. You come all the time, Jason. So yeah, for the it's most not part, safe. Right. It's not safe. I used to love I'd come with my wife, I'd bring my kids, we'd go to a show. 
um, you know, hang out mostly in Manhattan, but it's not safe to do so. I mean, there's pot everywhere on the streets. Homelessness is a major problem. The crime is is rampant. I had an incident when I was in uh, one of these little convenience stores at 6.30 in the morning. People came in and ransacked the place and just pillaged it and took took off with all this stuff. And the shop owner, I felt so bad for him, but I felt I felt a real threat to my safety. And even just walking to the studios was, uh, you know, it doesn't feel as safe as it used to be. So uh, right now they asked Democrats, uh, the uh, the New York Times Siena College poll, they asked Democrats, what's the most important issues to you? 17% said the economy. 17% said inflation. 11% said the state of democracy. I guess imagine voting. 8% means abortion. And 7% Trump and Republicans. So what the Repub- Democrats have been running on is Trump and abortion. And that's why they had a great July. Trump was everywhere with the raid. And abortion was the ruling. But I was shocked being those numbers are dipping and they're seeing the polls that we see that Joe Biden did this yesterday. Cut one. And I've said before, the court got Roe right nearly 50 years ago. And I believe Congress should codify Roe once and for all. (laughs) Right now, we're short a handful of votes. If you care about the right to choose, then you got to vote. That's why in these midterm elections are so critical. So he's talking about abortion being the reason to vote. The theory is he needs young people to vote. But it was brought up by Peter Ducey in the press conference. Cut four. What is President Biden's top domestic priority now? Is it inflation or is it abortion? The president's going to continue to talk about issues that matter to the American people. And... Abortion is one of them. Majority of the American people uh, disagree with the decision that uh, that the Supreme Court made, the Dobbs decision. That is, a majority of the people uh, disagreed with that. When it comes to the economy, the president has made it very, very clear. When it comes to inflation, it is the, his number one economic priority. So he, she was caught. She said she was caught there. Uh, Peter asked you directly. I, I'm stunned by it. You know politics. What's the what's the strategy? Um, the the bottom line is their policies. The Democrats have the House, the Senate, and the presidency. So any excuse that they didn't get the policies that they wanted, or that things are the Republicans' fault, I mean, just falls flat. Um, look, Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump, they are not on the the ballot this year. The policies are, and the policies have been failing us. And so if you want different results, you're going to have to elect some different people. I think that's why the House and the Senate are going to flip. I think that's why, um, you know, Lee Zeldin potentially will be the next uh, governor uh, of New York. You realize how stunning that would be, right? Oh, it it really is. But it feels like that wave is really more is is materializing because I think people get more and more focused on the issues. They start to recognize that we have no energy policy in this country that's going to make things reasonable for the American people, that inflation will be here in perpetuity if you don't fix that part of the uh, the equation and they offer no solutions crime is getting worse democrats offer no solutions immigration is getting worse no solutions there for the border and and the homelessness problems that that start to come with this these issues so you take the bulk of the issues they're just not there and if you really look at the dobbs issue abortion didn't go away it just said hey states you get to make these decisions in places like kansas it was surprising they were more liberal than I thought they would be. But these decisions now get to make, be made in, with state legislators, and, and the American people understand this. And so I think the Democrats oversold the abortion issue, that suddenly abortion was not going to be available, um, you know, a countrywide. And then people are realizing, oh, okay, well, you can still do it. And um, But when pressed, are there any limits Now Democrats are in a tough spot because do you really think, I don't think that most Americans believe that right up until that last 10 seconds before that baby uh, comes out, that it's okay to abort that baby and kill that baby. That is a very radical idea. Um, Yeah, and what they're trying to say is that's a private issue. That's uh, the answer that Democrats give uh, when asked about that. Among likely voters, what do you think is the most important problem facing the country? Among all likely voters, 26% say the economy, 18% say inflation, 8% say the state of democracy. Then comes immigration tied with abortion at 5%. That's the same New York Times poll. 
So that's pretty significant. And now education is moving up, too. So I'm wondering what they're looking at. I saw CBS's study, had their analyst on, and they said what the Democrats need is young people to vote in an unorthodox, strong way. So they think they have the young vote. They need them to come out in a midterm. And then that's why I guess the president was speaking at Howard University uh, yesterday. But the economy has, has simply flooded the zone. And the president's decision to empty the strategic oil reserve while blaming Saudi Arabia and Russia, I don't think is going to fly. No, it doesn't make any sense. It's a band-aid. It's a political reserve that he's pulling from. It it offers about five days worth of, of energy. But um, and, and the stories that are coming out of Saudi Arabia, where the president asked to just have this, uh, you know, delayed, not actually, he's not fixing and solving the problem. And I, I think the the 435 Democrats that are on the ballot, the, the senators that are on the ballot this year, when asked and pressed in town hall meetings, okay, so what are you going to do about it? You know, I don't want to pay double the gas that it was last year. They're left empty handed. That it, Solar panels ain't going to cut it. And I'm a believer in all of the above energy, but to solve the problem going into this winter right now, the fact that food is so much more expensive to put on the table that people are going to be skimming at Thanksgiving, that is all on the Democrats. It's because their policies were implemented, and this is the consequence. So when we look at the Ukraine war, Kevin McCarthy indicates that spending is not going to be as free uh, if they House flips right to Republicans. Do you think that's a good philosophy? I hope so, because, look, um, inflation is too much money uh, trying to get too few goods. So you can do you got to do two things. You got to cut back on the money supply, which is what the Federal Reserve is trying to do by raising interest rates. You can't have Washington, D.C. throwing trillions of dollars into the economy, about 25 percent of our GDP. That is one out of every four dollars spent in this country is spent by the federal government. That is so fundamentally wrong and out of control. If you can do that and increase the supply of your energy products, guess what? You'll do what Donald Trump did and drive down the actual cost of heating and fuel. And the consequence is all the other goods and services become less expensive. Let's flash forward to Utah. Debate was a couple of uh, a few nights ago where Mike Lee was sitting next to Uh, Evan McMullen, uh, at which time he's a former Republican. He says he's an independent. Mike Lee has gotten 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 support from every Republican in the Senate except Mitt Romney. He says he wants to stay neutral. You know, the Romneys. Well, why? Um, I don't know. Um, It's kind of a mystery. I will note that Mike Lee did not endorse Mitt Romney when he ran. I don't think uh, Mike Lee needs or will be hurt by, uh, you know, however Mitt Romney goes. Um, people but it are... is a tight race, right? No, not really. I, I think it's a facade. I think Mike Lee still wins by double digits, and in most races uh, they would look at it. It's a Democratic fantasy land. It's embarrassing for the Democrats. Did Democrats didn't even feel the candidate. And you know what happened is Evan McMullen went in and said, look, I'll actually be the Democrat. Vote for me. And that's what they're doing. He, Evan McMullen will not even take a position on who he's going to caucus with. And, that, and that's the scary. If you're going to go in and you're not going to tell him whether you're going to be with, with uh, Chuck Schumer or, or the Republicans, that's a pretty easy ask, I think, for somebody who's running for the Senate. I don't know. I'll make up my mind later. Why should we vote that person in? I hear you. you. Utah's the one place where Bill Clinton came in third, and he did so twice. We're still pretty conservative out here. We're not going with some unknown quantity and replacing a very effective senator in, in Mike Lee. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. They see it seemed to be a rough debate. It was, for, I mean, on both sides, they were beating each other up pretty good, four to six points. But Jason Chaffetz does not think it's that close. Jason, always great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. You got it. When we come back, I'm getting a lot of your emails about immigration, about what happened in Florida, as well as that debate last night in uh, for the Senate seat there. This is the Brian Kilmeade Show. I'll come back with that and so much more. Uh, don't move. Learning something new every day on the Brian Kilmeade Show. A talk show that's real. This is the Brian Kilmeade Show. The history of this country has always been tied to welcoming those who are fleeing harm. And that is the spirit of this country. 
It must be done in an organized way. And I, I believe that we will always be responsible as, as New Yorkers to make sure whoever comes here, we're going to do our job, and that's what we have done. I think that New York has been a role model on how to effectively use our infrastructure to address the crisis and make sure we treat people in a humane way. And that's what we have done. Really? Okay. You built a tent city in the Bronx in a parking lot. The outrage was so great in AOC's area that you had to move it for $350 million to move it to Randall's Island, another $330 million to put it up again. $300,000, I should say. So you put it up again, and guess what it contains? You get three meals a day. You get a recreation room that goes in the Xbox. You get full laundry service, 500 beds. Listen, this is probably better than 90% of the Central and South American countries. But guess who's paying for it? All of us out of our tax dollars. The federal government hasn't written a check yet. This is insane that Eric Adams had his political experts say it's a great idea to walk a tent city with nice harp music in the background, maybe mixed with the Elton John piano, and act as if you care about people. We're not talking about flood victims. These are not refugees, for the most part, running from, uh, running from the, the cartels. They paid the cartels to get here because they want a better life. They want our life. And that's fine. That's why we have immigration. We absolutely need it. We need the workers. We need, the, we need to grow as a country while well, Russia and Japan and all these other countries wither. We flourish because we're so great. But there's got to be a system to it. Eric Adams doing what he did has guaranteed we're going to get millions more across our border. And uh, Let's go out to Anthony. Listen on WABC. Hey, Anthony. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Good morning. First off, I want to thank you for taking my call. Secondly, I want to thank everybody at WABC for the incredible job that they're doing and spreading the word. Absolutely. So, like I told your call taker, I was, uh, I was did 24 years with the New York City Police Department, retired homicide investigator. And I sit here and I listen to this station and I, I just become infuriated, infuriated on how some of these people sit here and they just don't listen to the facts. Forget about Republican, forget about Democrats, forget about conservative, liberal, whatever you are. Just look at what is happening. The facts are the facts. You can't travel in train stations anymore. And any politician that turns around and says that this is something that is happening uh, not as frequent as we're trying to make it, are you kidding me? Like the mayor. First off, the mayor said like, that. First off, let's, let's talk about this mayor. This mayor, I worked with him in the police department. As useless as he is now is as useless as he was back then. The fact of the matter is, is that he is nothing more than a news hound. He loves to put himself front page. Let's take a look at what he's done so far. Crime has risen. Anybody disputes that? Just look at the facts. Secondly, what has happened to the homeless within the city? Our own homeless. You're taking on additional people from additional countries, which I'm not saying not to do, but let's just do it first off legally. Absolutely. Let's do it the right way. Let's follow the laws that are on the books that my parents had to follow and everybody else that came before them had to follow. But nonetheless, let's just say we want to take care of everybody in the world. How long do you think that this could possibly happen? How long do you think financially this city could sustain all these people coming in and we're opening up our arms like as if we got this bank that continuously grows money out of nowhere. People better right. start realizing. I hear you, I hear you Anthony. So let me give you a scenario. Well, yesterday, a Brooklyn dad got stabbed to death because a female cop was getting beaten up on the subway system. He jumped in and the lunatic stabs him in the neck and he dies. 43 years old, stabbed to death while riding in the subway, leaving three kids. The guy is a, a steam fitter. Uh, he was uh, a local 638. So his name is Tommy Bailey. How many more stories do we have to hear like this? If you're not being sucker punched and knocked out with a brain bleed, looking to recover and learn how to walk again, you all of a sudden stick up for a police officer who doesn't get qualified immunity should they ever be the aggressor and be sued. So while Lee, by the way, I hear you guys, uh, the NYPD can't even fill up their academies anymore. Brian, they've lessened the, they've lessened the education requirements. They've lessened the physical requirements. Let me tell you something. People in this city have to realize. Now, I'm not one for violence. I did almost 35 years between Homeland Security and between the New York City Police Department and following the rules, following the laws, making sure that, you know, we always had a law-abiding society. But okay. people better realize that the people that they put in office 
have a long-term effect on their life, on their sustainability, on how financially sound they are, and how their day-to-day quality of life is actually handled because you have gotcha. these politicians. All right, I'm up against a break, Anthony. I got it. Uh, we're totally let down, but I appreciate the service to the city. So listen, just a quick announcement. Go to briankillme.com. I got my paper coming out on the 25th. You can pre-order it now. President, uh, the President of Freedom Fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and the Battle to Save America's Soul. I'll be talking about that on stage in a great night, co-produced with Fox Nation. I'll be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, November 13th. And Saturday, the day before, in uh, Branford, Mississippi, Brandon, Mississippi. And then I'll be uh, in Newark, New Jersey, December 2nd. I want to see everybody there. Fox News headquarters in New York City. Always seeking solutions, never sowing division. It's Brian Kilmeade. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest moments of the Brian Kilmeade Show. So glad you're here. Uh, a busy day for the President of the United States. Let me see, where is he going to be today? He is, uh, well, we know this. We'll have a press briefing, which should be comical, because I've never seen a press briefer come out more uh, less uh, prepared than Green Jean-Pierre. And the president will be delivering remarks uh, about additional actions to strengthen energy security and lower costs. So that means, I don't know, begging uh, Iran, begging Venezuela, or releasing more emergency oil reserves. With me in studio, if you're smart enough to get Fox Nation, and he won't pay for it himself. He sits there getting it comped. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Failure is here from Fox Across America. And James Murray, uh, uh, James Murray will be here in a little while, better known as Murr for Impractical Jokers. Do you know him? I don't know him personally, but we've seen each other at events. A cool guy and a funny guy. Right. Yeah. Does he resent you? No, not on any level. Not no. at all. Uh, all of us, you know, comedians uh, are a pretty tight fraternity. Tighter than people really, because we're crazy people. You know, right. all the crazy people find each other. Right. In a weird way, we're all like traveling pack ships in the night. You know, we're all spending 23 hours a day watching dirty movies in a La Quinta. Right. And then we go tell jokes for an hour and pretend that's a job. It's great. I've never quite heard comedians described quite <laughs> like that, but I'm pretty sure that some are insulted. Hey, um, let's get to the big three. Now with the stories you need to know, it's Brian's Big Three. Number three. So we're not considering uh, new releases releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We don't have anything more to share or we're not going to be uh, considering new releases. Or we are and we did. Uh, energy idiocy. Uh, tap oil reserve. Stop drilling. Offering less and less leases. Blame Putin and Saudi Arabia. I have just summed up the energy policy of this administration. Number two. Go, go through item after item. You know, you want more criminals on the street? You vote for Fetterman in Pennsylvania. You want to make sure that Biden continues to inflate the economy? You vote for Warnock in Georgia. Newt Gingrich not on board the Biden train. Uh, key race rundowns will go over, including a big debate last night in Florida. Number one. The president once told us that inflation was his top domestic priority. Now we are told inflation is his top economic priority as he decides to stake his side's midterm chances on abortion access. Yes, flailing. That's what it seems Biden is doing and suddenly choosing abortion over inflation, crime and the border as their priority. We will show you what the people say they care about, including Democrats. Jimmy, did you see the poll yep. from the New York Times? It says this is like the fifth most important thing. Yeah, yeah. So what is he doing? And The economy is number one. They are so bad. You know the phrase, read the room? Like they're they're yeah. just ignoring the room. I always they, the example I always give is like they they obviously their je- their agenda is nobody else's, and that's why they've had to pivot a few times because nothing has stuck. You know, they were going to run on January sixth, then they were going to run on you know abortion Trump. and Trump and Orange Man Bed and everything in between. But the problem is what happened, Brian. I really do think this is true. Is our issues in this country in terms of the overall decline in the quality of life, whether yes. it's crime or inflation, are too big to ignore. Like in a better economy, you might get away with some inflation to say, hey, Trump's a bad guy, and it might work. But in this instance, like I think people just feel it too much, you know, financially. I'm not talking about me physically who looks a little beat up from last night. I'm talking about people who feel it in their wallet. You can't, you can't overlook what they've done. Right, uh, on a daily basis. So it, the, the ripple effect of having high energy prices, 
when it comes to the diesel that goes into a truck that's going to deliver the food and the food is more expensive and labor costs go up. And then a guy like you, Jimmy, go in there and say, hey, inflation has gone up. Yeah. I need a raise. Yeah, how about well, that? you're screwing up the economy, too, <laughs> because you get a raise. Raise? I get paid in beer. Right. What are you talking about? Kill, kill me. Right, I, no. get, I get drink tickets at Chuck E. Cheese. What right. are you talking about? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think they're still paying you in beer. I think that you got to get a, a much whiskey. better agent. I got a better agent. I got whiskey now. It's bourbon. So, <laughs> so I, I want you to hear I want you to hear what the area You'll probably play it on your show shortly. Mm -hmm. But here's Eric Adams announcing his 10th city. Cut 17. The history of this country has always been tied to welcoming those who are fleeing harm. And that is the spirit of this country. It must be done in an organized way. And I I believe that we will always be responsible as, as New Yorkers to make sure whoever comes here, we're going to do our job. And that's what we have done. So, that, so who do you think consulted him yeah. to say, "Take go embrace this tent city in Randall's Island. Let me walk through it. Yeah. Three meals a day. You yeah. get to pick your own food. They do your laundry. They <laughs> fold and give it to you. <laughs> That's like, they actually have a pretty good racket when you think about it. Right. It's, it's so embarrassing to the city. You know, when you walk around this city, as you know, we have a massive homeless crisis. And a lot of these guys, sadly, are guys who fought for the country. So the message here in New York is if you fight for the country, you're on your own. But if you break into the country, three hots in a cot, gluten-free. More than that. What's not to love? Oh, yeah. It's crazy. So, but the thing is, you have just guaranteed another million, two million people Easy. P- pouring into the border. There's four million this year. Growing up in college, everybody can probably relate to this on some level. There was a bar that would let people in that didn't check ID. And when word got out that the bar was easy to get into, packed. all the people who should were packed. And that's what they've done to the country. They've turned it into the college bar that doesn't check ID. Right. Because the message is never what you say, it's what you do. If you apprehend people at the border and let them into the country, they don't call home and go, we got caught. They call home and sing Looks Like We Made It by Barry Manilow. I don't know that they sing Manilow, but I don't, they don't strike me as a Manilow looks crowd. Like, looks like we made right. it. That I'm whole a little thing. side with a younger audience, but <laughs> most people. <laughs> most, the border demo. It's a tricky demo. Right. Uh, <laughs> most people, though, if you hear Barry Manilow, yeah. no, they don't turn it off, no, especially no. at a wedding. It is. Right? He crushes. Copacabana right. has probably been played right up there with Shout. Yes. And like what I like about you sneaks into a lot of wedding playlists. What I like about you. Ramones? That one. I think it's uh man, I should know this and but, I feel but bad now. Here's the thing with Barry Manilow. Uh-huh. Even though I remember Arsenio Hall when he had this hot late night show. Uh-huh. He said, I love Barry Manilow and he yes, had him on did. and Barry Manilow was like, I can't figure out if you're making fun of me or not. <laughs> I, no, he was I, a right, fanalo. Right. He was a fanalo. Uh, is, it, is that is they that call them fanalos. Uh, I didn't know though that. But he to me, I think if you take away the acoustics and the enhancements mm-hmm. I think Barry Manilow might struggle. Whoa. What do you think? This is very conspiratorial. Like, right. gonna, really like do you think pro- that he's really got some... that powerful voice? No, I think Matt, I think Barry has some chops. I do I do think you he do. has some chops. Yeah. Um on the level we're describing, uh, I've seen other people get their voice mixed to the point. Like, I, I grew up in a big Beatle house, and I do feel like they're, they're, they're making the wind blow out for Paul a little bit now when you see when you see him. You know what I mean? Right. And I love him. He's great. But, but I don't know. That's it's an interesting term. What but, do you mean by that? Well, they're not. Well, what they do with Paul is they have big background vocals oh. that kind of blend the harmonies. Right. And that's a little bit going on with the Rolling Stones. But the Rolling Stones are older. Like, they've changed their songs. Get off of my cloud is now get off of my lawn. You know, like, <laughs> start me up is help me up. It's a right. different. It's a different vibe now, right. but it's fun. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Didn't, weren't they forced to change lyrics to one of their songs? Yes, Brown people? Sugar. Right. Because it, it had some dicey lyrics. Uh, right. I think they were overtones to slavery, and they just punted. But, you know, the, they've been singing the song for uh, 100 years. I don't know how long they've been together, 50, 60 years. And uh, they punted only recently, like right. very recently. And you know what? They probably just don't want the bat. They don't want to deal with it. I just want to deal with it. So if you're, if you're in your late hundreds and you've got a billion dollars, you don't get yelled at. Did by you some... see the Beatles documentary? Yes. And were you more impressed or less impressed with them? No, I'm more impressed. The thing about the Beatles that I, I, I truly am inspired by is the attention to detail. Like they did put everything they had into making a phenomenal product. And I know it sounds crazy because I'm a silly guy, but I kind of do that because I don't show up with a lot intellectually. So I have to really work around the edges like to how make do, the how album do you sound pre- good. How do you prepare? <laughs> I read everything in the morning. Like right. by, you know, you know, when you're up doing Fox and Friends, obviously you get up super early. I get up like you because I keep taxi hours. So I'm reading at like 3, 4 in the morning. By the mm-hmm. time I walk in here, I kind of know what I'm doing at noon and I'm prepped to go do whatever TV I want. But for me, it's kind of less structured only because coming from a comedy background, right? you want everything to be like kind of fluid and organic and in the moment. So I don't over prepare. 
You, does that make sense? Did you want to react? Yeah, I want to show up and give you takes. I'm a Vander Holyfield. I'm a counterpuncher. Right, uh, but a Vander Holyfield did have a hole in his heart at one point. <laughs> he hope said he had his ear bit. <laughs> right. Remember he lost to Michael Moore, who yes. gave him trouble. Did South Post give you trouble, too? Uh, I do all right, because I, I grew up fighting my brother Mike, who's a lefty. He I was grew, a lefty. I grew up in a cop house. You know, everyone in my house was a cop. Like, literally everyone. Like, I would have been a cop if I could have passed the background check, I'm sure. But right. I'm but no, I, was a, I grew up in the toughest division in sports. Three cops in a house. Like, you get beat up. Uh, Levittown, man. Nassau cool. County, Strong Island. Right. And, uh, you know, in Levittown. Was it a Levitt house? I what? Yeah. We grew up in a Levitt ranch. My mom sold Levitts. Uh, she still sells Levitts in Levittown. And everybody in Levittown, as you know, was a post-World War II settlement for GIs returning home from war. So I grew up around a lot of old men you should never make a sudden move around. A lot right. of guys, <laughs> just like you, you, you spooked him. I could punch him in the head, but I needed it sometimes. Bill O'Reilly came from there. He did, man. He did. Um, our town, it's funny because you know, there's a Billy Joel connotation, but he went to Hicksville. Levittown's got a lot of history, and I didn't realize how many Levittown knockoffs there are. Right. Like they built a Levittown, Pennsylvania. I've been there. It's nice. There's a Levittown, Puerto Rico. Did I know that? Yeah, and there was a Levittown in New Jersey. Check this out. There was a Levittown. We're covering a lot here. We went from Manilow's Acoustics to Levittown, New Jersey. Right. <laughs> but there's a cluster of Levitts in New Jersey that they renamed because they thought the post office was going to have an issue given its proximity to the one in Pennsylvania. I did not know that. Jimmy Fail, a Levittown historian. <laughs> now, do you, is, some, is the goal to leave Levittown? Because, you know, also Jake Steinfeld, Body by Jake. Yeah. That'll be, yeah. <laughs> right. Also saw the lacrosse league. Yes. Lacrosse. Good lax. Levittown's got good lacrosse. And we got, you know, good baseball. Division Avenue baseball. One of the right. bunch of state titles under my man, Doug Robbins. Um, did you know this? This is a good Levittown fun fact. The late, great Doug Robbins won a bunch of state titles for the Division Blue Dragons. Used to, I, was, I used to rag uh, my junior and senior year of high school. I didn't play baseball. I played football. But I used to rag the other team so incessantly that our coach used to take me out of seventh period to give me dirt. Like, hey, this kid on Garden City didn't get into Princeton. Ah. <laughs> and you know what I mean? So, so I'd be in the bleachers so you'd have facts. Uh, drinking a Slurpee with gin in it, yelling at some poor kid who just got rejected. You're never going to get into Princeton swinging like that. Right. And the and kid's like, how did he know I got rejected by Princeton? Now, was this, did this make your parents proud? They actually did love this. And I'll tell you a funny story. Dennis Schneidler, who won the Diamond Award as the best player in Nassau County, threw a no-hitter on Memorial Day against Garden City. And I got the game ball. Why? For Reagan. Because I, I had so turned their minds inside out because belligerence, just nonstop belligerence. Now, would people threaten you? Uh, they'd get into it, but we had the numbers, you know. It was always division games. You'd so really you were rag. being guarded. Yes, it was always – I always had some muscle around me. So you were, that was you, you working out your comedy. Yeah, absolutely. Like comedy for me has always been this. I grew up the youngest in a house full of tough cops that would beat you up, so I needed to make them laugh to keep right. them at bay. And then when I got into dating like in middle school and just liked girls, I looked like I was in my third trimester. So you got to be able to crack them up if you're walking around with the physique of a before model. So I was just always slanging jokes. Man, and it worked. It worked, kill I'm hanging out with you. Come right, on, this is a joke. But we're not dating. You know, we, we're going. We're going through the you know the what are we t- phase. We shouldn't do this on the air. But that's true. <laughs> um, so so uh, when's the next time you doing stand up? Oh wow, kill me. Are you ready for this? I will be at the Spokane Comedy Club at Spokane next Friday and Saturday. Following week at Red Rocks Resort in Vegas, two sellouts, pretty rad for me. Uh, then we're going down to Texas, and then we go to uh, Oklahoma City, Bricktown Comedy Club. The following, and the good news is you could take the radio. I mean, it's, it's portable, so, so if you awesome. uh, if you have a Wednesday thing, you could do it. It's so awesome. The ability of technology to to give us the portability that we have, and it doesn't kind of blow your mind that we're here now. Because it sounds good. Right. It's not like I could be, we could be in a hotel right now. We're not. We're at Fox News headquarters, but you wouldn't know the difference. It's that good. Right. No, I've, I've, I just don't know how people do it like uh, Clay and Buck. Yeah, yeah. Separate locations. I couldn't do that. Like after, oh, over the course of time, because I do feel like you miss those natural like reads of the other person. Right. So you what know? are comedy clubs like now? Um, to be honest, Bri, the comedy clubs never got as hostile as the Internet did. Most of our problems started when the jokes left the room. You know what I mean? Everyone in the room shook hands on yeah. the agreement. We're going to buy two drinks, and we're all going to you know, kind of throw away our worries for a little while. It's when it gets to the other consumer on the Internet who is trying to use their grievance as like a weapon. Like I don't think people are ever as offended as they pretend to be. I right. just think being offended usually gets you some type of capital in this day and age. So I think on the whole, though, people are so exhausted by the idea of there being a stigma around comedy right. that they're leaning back in. Like, we're filthier but, than ever. Let's say if you go up there and it becomes clear that you don't hate Trump, let's yeah. say you might even like him. <laughs> and if you're in New York City at mm-hmm. Gotham Comedy Club. You know Club, what I do? Okay. And they go, oh, please, that you know, guy's there. Do you know what I do in, only in New York gigs, okay, is a 15-minute set. 
I will sing the hits, like murder, everything you know, it's unstoppable. 13 minutes into 15, I go, by the way, I work at Fox News. And I'm like, you can't get mad now. You love me. I'm like, you took the money. Right. You loved me. We had a great 13 minutes. I'm like, if this goes downhill now, it is on you. You're terrible people. Right. And they and, laugh at that. And then do you find that there are people there that don't hate Fox News or most of them do? Most people, this is the thing, in the presence of someone they've seen on TV are usually cool. Most people, because there's a reverence for TV, right? you know, that probably makes me look more credible than I am to them. But they're actually cool. And you know you'd be surprised by, Brian? Well, you wouldn't. But, um, but people walk up to you in this city all the time. And, but they whisper, like, hey, man, I love Fox News. Right, Keep right. It up. It's funny. It reminds me of the old Frosted Flakes commercials. Remember they'd show the adults with their faces blacked out, and they'd be like, I eat Frosted Flakes every day. They're great. <laughs> in right. New York, that's the Fox News fan. But they're out there. Right. Uh, I think the hostilities dissipated yes. to a degree since mm-hmm. Trump left. Oh, absolutely, man. But, uh, even know, though he's coming back. <laughs> even though he's dusting off the old right, suit. He's only been impeached twice. Yeah. They never went through with it. <laughs> he, was, he gets, like, he gets like another free golf course. Right. He gets a third impeachment. There's I mean, something, right? I mean, when there was one impeachment, we had one impeachment in our youth. It was on film. Six o'clock, we waited to find out the latest with Nixon. Yeah. And then we have Clinton. That was turned out. Then well, we had... Two with two in four years with Trump, yeah. and now we have countless investigations. Yeah. One used to destroy a political career. Yes. No, no. Now impeachments are like the Olympics. Like a different city gets to host every two right. years. Yeah. We just <laughs> watch it. It's crazy. Like Elise Stefanik had said, said yesterday, she's like, I'm looking to impeach Biden. Please. We just stop. Right. But can, this, can we... We're just exhausted. Like, right. what are you doing this to us right. for? Man? I mean, the whole world stops. You watch these guys yell at each other. Nobody listens. Nobody cares. All right. Uh, but we care about you. You have to do Harris Falk. the man. Show. It's go time. Right. Queen Would you be dressed this nice if you weren't doing Harris No. Show? You know. <laughs> Kill me is always. He is the fashion police. We have to defund the fashion police. Right. He's always Because tra- I do radio. I do kind of look like I'm driving a cab when I do radio. Right. But on TV, I, I look like a guy going to court. Right. But I you'll quickly like strip down. Jury. Like you want to be stripped down as quick as possible. Yeah, oh, this when you see me in the hall after the Harris, right. I, I will not be in this. No, but I would keep walking. I, don't, I, I try <laughs> not to acknowledge you. Jimmy, best. best of luck at noon. Love you and best of luck in Harris. And don't be afraid to mention the show uh, with Harris Faulkner. Oh, I'm all over it. Maybe reference. Just, as I, I was, mentioned to Brian Kilmeade. Just I was talking me. to Kilmeade. <laughs> right. All right, watch this. Mr. Kilmeade. <laughs> if you don't mind. Jimmy, thank you. Back in a moment. Want even more, Brian? Download the podcast at BrianKilmeadeShow.com. Every episode, exclusive interviews on demand. More of Kilmead coming up. A radio show like no other. It's Brian Kilmead. All right, uh, James Murray came in a couple of minutes early as an executive or a big superstar. You can do that. Uh, Murray, we're going to go to break in like two minutes. You have a new book out called Area 51 Interns uh, Zoned Out. This is for kids. Yes, uh, which is why I decided to come on your show because you have so many young followers. That's my that's that my breadbasket. Yeah, absolutely. That's your sweet what spot. is the age of that? That's not toddlers. Oh, no, no. This is a middle grade children's book series. Underserved. It's- uh, uh, yes, is eight to twelve. Eight, eight to twelve is the sweet spot for this book. That being said, adults will love it too. Honestly, it's a great sci-fi, hysterical comedy kind of book. And people know you from uh, f- from To Catch a Predator. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's never been found guilty. Uh, yeah. uh, no, you, <laughs> the Impractical Joker. Yes, of course. You're uh, Mur. Yeah, I'm Mur. Is that Everybody? what people say to you? Yeah, they call you that. Yeah, my friends call me Mur. Are friends. you? Are you? This is not your finale. You're doing another season. We are shooting season ten right now. It starts February second. You have promised year. me anecdotes and insights. I have this upcoming great season. stories from the upcoming season. Hey, Pete, did we pull any tape of Mur? Did we anything at all? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Uh, now, normally, if this happened with you, would you fire them? Uh, uh, I'm I'm amazed he still has a job <laughs> at all. <laughs> but I can't get rid of him and Eric. Yeah, and no, I was gonna you got to keep one. One. But you, fire flip one. A- that way, the other one gets better. You want to flip a coin to the break? Yeah, sure. Oh, right. which one? Sure, <laughs> let's, let's do, do it. that. <laughs> hey, Murr's here. We're going to have a real segment with him in a moment. Area 51 Interns is now out. If you, have, if you care about your children, you will buy them this book. Yes. And if you don't, don't bother. Yeah, true. If you don't care, don't bother. (laughs) The more you listen, the more you'll know. It's Brian Kilmeade. I almost look at like a football season like you're going away on deployment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, man, here I go again. And there's only one way to do it. And I think, Jim, we've talked from time to time just about how do you enjoy the certain moments of it. 
you know? And the reality is, is you can really only be authentic to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever you may say, oh man, I want to, you know, make sure I spend a little more time doing this, you know, during the season. Yeah. The reality is, is when it comes down to it, your competitiveness takes over. And as much as you want to have this playful balance with the work (laughs) balance, you're going to end up doing exactly what you've always done, which is why you are who you are. You're going to go, how the f*** do I get it done? You know, what do I got to do for my teammates to get it done? So joining us uh, to expand on what Tom Brady said, a man who's been compared to Tom Brady pretty much every waking day of his life. Uh, James Murray, writer, executive producer of the hit TV show and Practical Jokers, author of the brand new book, Area 51 Intern, Zoned Out. And if you like your children, you will get them this book. So do you know what Tom Brady was trying to say? Tom Brady is a um, quarterback. Co- uh, got it. Tall, uh, handsome man. Uh, for Congress? or I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> he's, in, he's in joy. He dresses in uh, a tight uniform. Got it. Wears a helmet. So he's a cheerleader. Oh, he's the co- okay, I understand. Uh, didn't he retire? Once. Once. Right. We, we all kind of take right. a break. Yeah, every really, yeah. You just needed a break for a few months. So I don't really know what that means. Uh, I thought you could help me. Sure. What What? What? what part didn't you understand? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So he's saying you could say what you say you think you should say, but you're going to ultimately do what you want to do. Yeah. And is that at all mirror your life? You could say anything, but you're just going to do what you want to do anyway. The, the, the story checks out for me. Yeah. It sounds... Uh, I'm unclear. Right. I'm unclear <laughs> why we picked that sound. Like. Yeah. And I'm trying to rescue it. Uh, hi, Brian. Right. How are good to you? See you? So, Murr, it's always, fun. it's always great because you're the most productive person I know. Now you have a br- another book out, which means you have to come by. I do. Oh, I, I would come by no matter what. If you text, you, you know, just text me to come by. I'll come by and hang out. Well, like, but you, I mean, how busy are you? You're doing the live shows. You're doing another season of Practical yes. Jokers. You're writing these books. Yes. So, in fact, you said you had a show last night. I did. I had two shows in Westfield, New Jersey, which of course, is the home of The Watcher on Netflix, which I'm watching right now, coincidentally. Wow. You know the story? Nope. It's about, you know the story. Remember that couple that moved to New Jersey and uh, they kept getting threatening letters in their mailbox and they eventually had to move out. They couldn't find out who was sending it. The doc is all about that. It's great. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But you were there unrelated. On, uh, no, I, I'm the watcher. I'm, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. I was the guy that was sending the threatening letters. Oh, okay. Yeah, they still, yeah. Yeah. My bad. My yeah. bad. I listened yeah. to the show back and realized my mistake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so for you, when you do your live shows, you try to create some of the magic you do on tape. On we Impractical do, Joker. yeah. Uh, when I do like my murder live shows, I play Impractical Jokers live at the end of the show where I send an audience member out into the streets of wherever we are and they have to do and say what I tell them and we're watching on stage. And today, the uh, Impractical Practical Jokers tour went on sale. We're doing 40 different arenas next year all, all right. around the country. We announced maybe half of those arenas already, including uh, UBS Arena and uh, Prudential Center and some other great, great places across the country. UBS right on uh, off Cross Island Park. Right, right there. Right where the Islanders play. Yes, indeed. You will tell the Islanders to get off the ice every show. Yeah, no, the, we, it's actually our show is during the game. It's, it's like, during the game. Yeah, it's, it's in, uh, what do you call it, hockey are, halftime? No. Right, no, no, in between periods. Periods. That's all right, it. so you'll well, wait no for them to it's stop. It's three periods. Because yes. you don't need the competition. Yeah. So... So, Eric, you know the soundbite I wanted? What did you say? Yeah, but do you know the one I wanted? The uh, military, when he compared himself to the military. Uh, on Monday night, Tom Brady, I think he's, listen, for the longest time I'm in awe of his talent, for him to do it 46 where he does a 46. But he's made a couple errors. One, he compared his life, and this is one thing you shouldn't do. In Practical Jokers, you wouldn't say it's like being at war. No, it's not. Right. And so when Tom Brady said, when I go football, it's like being in the military. Got it. He's being heavily. uh, Well, you know, when uh, when our troops, uh, you know, raise the flag over Iwo Jima, it it, it feels very similar to watching him play. No. Yeah. A little bit. He throws a leather ball. So we have some memes. Uh, Black Hawk Dog veteran uh, trolls Tom Brady. Uh, Brad Thomas had some fun with Tom Brady's comparing playing in the NFL to deploy during the war. Brady's been getting dragged ever since for a couple of tone-deaf comments. He says, I almost look at football like we're going away for deployment in the military. It's like, man, here I go again. Right there, you knew you are in trouble. <laughs> says, well, Brad Thomas, who fought in Black Hawk Down as Army Ranger, poked a little fun at Brady. He shared a Photoshop photo of him <laughs> wearing full uniform at war with Delta Force. So they're kind of mocking him. That on top of his marriage going awry because his wife didn't want him to play football anymore. Oh, you know. 
What if you're? What I if mean, you my wife you? didn't want me to. That's why I, 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 I don't play football. My wife didn't want me to play either. So that is same, very, same thing. It's very similar to Tom Brady's story. So are you a better husband than Tom Brady? Uh, I, I'm a better. <laughs> you're a better no, spouse. No, I'm. A, I, I just. I'm. I'm saying that we both retired from football for the same reason. <laughs> I, I retired at birth. See, though. this is something when it, you sat for the pre-interview for an hour. Yeah. We never got that story. No, I know. It's all. Uh, <laughs> this just yeah. came out now. Yeah. Speaking of which, why do I have to pre-interview for an hour? I've, I've been because, on the show many times. Yeah, because. Because there's, we looked in bed. There's nothing interesting about you. No, I, and we just said there's got to be something. But keep, you, you, keep the door closed. There's got to be something. I would never compare Impractical Jokers to war, by the way. It, it, but, <laughs> if, but if I had to, yes. we're, we're like the Cold War. Right. That's <laughs> it. Yes. You know, Not much shooting, a lot of threat. Yeah, just a lot of words, a lot of you know, right. sideways. Except for that one time, Impractical Jokers went to the brink in 1960. Yes, when right on the edge. Kennedy was right president. Right on the edge. Right yeah. on the edge. Uh, that missile crisis. I so, had a blockade Sal's house. Yeah. Um, Sal is on Impractical Joker. He, he's one of who the decided to do stand up, by the way, right? Yes. So he just got a, like a straight stand up show. Yeah. He decided, I mean, that's his hobby. A lot of people try to get away from Impractical Jokers, do something different. Like, I'm going to golf. He says, just get away from Impractical Jokers, I'm going to do stand up. Yes. Is that odd? Can, no, of course not. Okay. We, we, we're all stand up comedians. We all do stand up comedy. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yes. When are you coming on the TV show? Because. Uh, I was across town today uh, at Good Day New York co-hosting for an hour. Oh, you did with, that again? Yes. Right? That's why I'm in a suit, right? Oh, I right? Did, a I different just, color today because right. you made fun of me the last two times I was here. I wore the same damn suit. Anyways, did I? Yeah. So, uh, okay. right. Eric so, usually knows. So Eric. Rosanna Scotto, lovely. We know her for years. Uh, just a uh, really, really uh, gracious uh, person. And, and their so family owns every restaurant. Every one. They own all the restaurants. Yeah. Uh, but she uh, has a cameo on Impractical Jokers next season. We had her. Uh, we were working uh, behind the, a shop downtown as the manager of like this bakery a restaurant. And she comes storming into the restaurant with a full camera crew and a microphone in our face and accuses us of something horrible that we are uh, – claim to have done in front of customers, real customers. And then as soon as she leaves, we've got to still try to make the customer buy the item. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> that, to and, me, that's great. It's great. Is that in this season? It's coming up. We teased it today on the show. But when's your cameo, Bri? Uh, Eric, what do you think? What do I, What are my demands? I mean, do, do I have... Do, What's in your writer? Did, I don't know. Did, did Rosanna Scotto have any demands? We, well, we got... We, Filled most of your demands. We have the briefcase full of the unmarked bills as you requested. Right. We have the drugs. We have right. the, the the medicines, the, the the liquor. Right. And we have the. I prefer uh, medication. Yes. Yeah. Prescription. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Medication. Yes, prescriptions. We right. have all that. I, I don't know, and we do have the skittles. Right. So I'm not sure what else we need. Okay. Uh, just give me. Well, what premise comes to mind now that I could do, knowing that I could do radio and TV. And I've dominated the stage now for years. Yeah. And by the way, I have shows coming up December 2nd in Newark. I'd like to invite you, but it's other people that way that I've had rather invite. Yeah. Uh, and, this, <laughs> and then um, I'm going to be in uh, Brandon, Mississippi, because you're not. Yeah, no, right. the, I, I actually you, make it a point not to go to Brandon. I'm not allowed legally. Right. You, you, know. you can go in, but you got to leave right away. I hate yeah. right? it. I can't away. be within certain yards of places. And those play delis? Uh, delis, specifically. Yes. I just go crazy with bagels. And then and, uh, and Tulsa the next day, Tulsa. November 13th. Okay. So we'll try to work out something I can do on your show. Yeah, but our only availability to have you on set are those days you're out of town. Oh, what a shame. I know. What are the, th- what are the chances of that? Uh, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you. And so, Eric, we pulled up. We thought you as a funny guy in Practical Jokers with a brand new book out that's not funny, that's educational, uh, area – Eric, um, it is funny. It's hysterical for kids. By the way, if you want an autographed copy for your kids or family members, go to area51novel.com. I mean, is it on offer as well? Yes, of course. It's uh, all based on Area 51. It's about a group of kids whose parents work at Area 51. They go to take your kids to work day. All hell breaks loose. And it's up to these kids, these best friends, to save the day every single book. This is book number two. Book number three comes out next May. It's great fun. Your kids will love it. So you have novels and you have young adult books. You yeah, call them young these, adult or you call them kids? What, you, what uh, is the right term? Uh, uh, I think middle grade, uh, middle grade uh, children's books. We call them young adult. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it'll help sales. Anything's a young adult, right? Because this is not like a toddler. Book. But by that, by that logic, you call a, a, a two month old a young adult. Where do you draw the line? Right. I would say three. <laughs> My three. Jokes, I look at three month old. Three to twenty one. That kid is old. Yeah, I, I do three months. It's 21. You know what I love? What? I get great joy out of doing those guest spots on your show at night. When you send oh. me a list of topics, well, I we... get the topics like two hours in advance. Yeah. And then it's – it's. I wish you could see my house. It's a full-blown – 
chaos running around getting props, filming stuff to send into the producers secretly to surprise you. So, I have so, so much Murray, fun now that you have a book out, well, for One Nation, which airs Saturday at, uh, at 8 o'clock, we should do it for your schedule and get it going, right? I, so, I would love to. So do, the book just you came enjoy out those? today? Yeah, it came out uh, yesterday. Okay, so yeah. yeah, so let's just let's keep the heat on. Do you get a kick out of those? I try oh, to make fantastic. you laugh. That's my goal is purely right. – I don't care about the audience. You my goal is my, purely to surprise by, you. By the way, you should hear my earpiece because that's the control room. Yeah. Because they're used to people coming on having a co- quick line or two. Sure. You are a physical comic on remote. I know. They're right? crazy. <laughs> I wish you could see they send, the, they send the van to my driveway, right? right? And the guy has no clue what I'm about Who to you do. Are. And – one time I had a ghost rise up from next to me when ah, we talk about yeah, you know, right. another time I had um I filmed a video of me uh working on the toilet. I like oh and I had a full dinner set up in the toilet. Wine, a full meal, yes, and I'm yes, on yes. the toilet. <laughs> I, I do it just purely to make you laugh. But I but we are in this. I don't the sell audience. a single book for you doing the show. You don't really. <laughs> we don't sell a single ticket, our ratings actually but go down. Pe- and people actually give books back. Yeah, at the end do. of the It's do. unbelievable. So all right, I, I'm gonna let's do it then and maybe next week. I would love to. Okay, good. Um it'll be great. And where can I just say where that? That's how good you look. This? Right. I know, but it depends on the topics. Uh, it's chaos in my house for the two hours leading up to your broadcast because literally my wife and I brainstorm ideas. What would be funny? What would be funny to do? Oh, to your wife's funny too? She's funny too. She's hysterical. And uh, and we're running around assembling props, filming tape, sending it in, editing real quick to get it into your show to surprise you. Do you actually edit? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. unbelievable. I feel so one-dimensional. So I wanted to just bring uh, this up. So – you don't watch – this might not go over good because you made it clear you don't listen to the news. You don't I, watch the news. I, I follow all the news. I don't know if I really – So do you know that Liz Cheney is leading the charge in January 6th because she hates Donald Trump? I've heard about that. Right. Yes. SNL, cold open, Saturday. Do you Which watch I, SNL I saw. I saw okay. the cold open. I saw the whole So episode. here's a little. I just wanted you to hear – I actually do think this is funny. Listen. Yeah. Over the past few months, this bipartisan committee has presented our case to all Americans – Whether you're a Republican who's not watching or a Democrat who's nodding so hard, your head is falling off. (laughs) One person is responsible for this insurrection, Donald Trump. And one person will suffer the consequences, me. (laughs) You might be wondering what makes me so tough. And I ask you, who is your dad? (laughs) Is it Dick Cheney? (laughs) You might wonder, how do you have the guts to take on your entire party alone? And I'd say, when you were little, who tucked you in at night? Funny. It's great. Right. They did like three, four more jokes there. Was it Dick Cheney? (laughs) Right. Because don't you miss traditional, like when SNL used to make fun of everybody? Yep. And late night TV used to make fun of everybody? Yep. Did you like watching late night TV? I did. I loved it. I I watch every week of a Saturday Night Live, you know? And uh, that was a particularly good cold open for sure. Right. And what about the, do you watch the, the, uh, the nightly shows? Uh, no, but I follow have, have you been on tonight show? Yeah, we've been on, uh, we, we have been scheduled on the tonight show many times and we, it has never worked out and it's going to work out. I think this fall we go on, so uh, but we've been on uh, every other show. Do you wait to the day before and change your mind? Like, what do you mean it doesn't work? Out? Uh, life has happened. I think COVID canceled it once and then new restrictions, the new wave canceled it a second time and then, uh, other, you know, so, but we'll be on for sure. And your thoughts about doing it? Like, do you where, will you sit with them? What's the procedure? Do you we, sit with them for like forty five minutes? We uh, it's it's actually less intense than getting on your show. Really? Yeah, yeah you guys put me through the ringer. I, I I I don't know if you guys realize this at home, but uh, Kilmeade's producers actually uh, require me to be strapped down while right. they pre-interview me. Some people try to which get is out. odd because I'm in my house at right. the time. <laughs> which is so weird. they send a crew to my house. They strap me down to a polygraph. Right. And then I have to answer these really kind of personal questions for hours. Uh, and then they use none of that and we just riff. Right. So what's the point? I'm not sure. Uh, a lot of times people walk out and they go, whatever you do. And they'll pretty much say the same thing. There's nothing there. Do not book. Don't, don't book yeah. more. They tell me that. They tell me they that to my tell face. You that? That it's is strange. They shouldn't do that. I've gotten uh, no fewer than a dozen calls from your team this week telling me not to show up today. Right. See, I tell them this is why I train them to talk behind your back, <laughs> and this, and for them to tell this to your face is not something I'm proud of. Yeah. Right. No, they, I think they they kind of get a kick out of telling me to my face. Right. It's like you know you see a wounded animal, you poke it. When we come back, when we come back, the one story from this season on Impractical Jokers that you're only going to get on our show. Okay, great. You got it. That you did not tell. You got it. The free interviews. 
James Murray is here. Uh, Area 51 interns zoned out is available. Go get it. This weekend, check out Brian's new show on Fox News Channel. His new Saturday show lets him ruin your weekends, too. Take it easy, Gutfeld. That really hurts. One Nation with Brian Kilmeade. Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Fox News Channel. More of Brian coming up. If you're interested in it, Brian's talking about it. You're with Brian Kilmeade. Hey, Alan. Okay, so everyone's going to have a choice to do one of two focus groups. You let us know which one you want to do. Simple as that. Okay. Uh, the first one is is hot gravy versus crotch. <laughs> hot gravy versus crotch. Yeah. They're pouring hot gravy on your crotch. Yeah, that would be the that would be that. <laughs> Okay, and for me, we have here, how many bay leaves can you eat until a green stool? <laughs> so, your choice, Alan? Uh, <laughs> you physically need a pour of hot gravy on me? It, yes, of varying degrees of temperature. I'll do that one. Though. I don't want to feel I don't think I'm going to eat bay leaves. You want to get hot gravy poured in your crotch instead of eating a bay leaf? How many do I have to eat of those? How many bay leaves until you excrete? <laughs> So that's a little of the new season, or is that an old yeah. season? You, that was last season. You, so you were talking during break that you, uh, you were just speaking to Benjamin Net Netanyahu. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first show in history to go from Netanyahu yes. to hot gravy and crotch. Can we take, wait, let's make sure. Hey, Pete, can you look that up? Can you make sure there might have been another? That's an unverified fact, Right, but I we, feel confident. You feel confident? <laughs> yeah. so, so the new season of Impractical Jokers. New season starts February 2nd next year. We've been filming season 10 for about two, three months now. We're right in the middle of it. And uh, I'll share a story. You said, tell me something more we've ever heard before. We almost got Post Malone arrested last week. So, you know, each episode of the show has a different celebrity yeah. as part of the show now. We've had everyone from Brooke Shields to Method Man. This season we have John Mayer, uh, Post Malone. We've got Kesha. Right. Wow. Michael Bolton. Some really great people that we love uh, our whole lives. So the other day we were filming with uh, Post Malone. And him and Q were working as parking garage attendants downtown. And the punishment was this. As people would come in to collect their car, Sal and I got to do whatever we wanted to the car before we put in the elevator to send down to Post and Q. So when, as soon as it pulled out of the elevator, they had to deal with the ramifications of what we did to the person's car. So at one point we had the car come down and it was full of smoke as if Post Malone was smoking in there. <laughs> Another time, these two women are waiting for the car. We put roadkill in the trunk. <laughs> and... They freaked out and called 911, and the cops came and almost arrested Q and Post Malone. That is awesome. Uh, Murrow can't wait for the new season. And Area 51 interns, pick it up and watch his live shows. Put the power of over 100 meteorologists and the worldwide resources of Fox in your hands with the Fox Weather Podcast. Precise, personal, powerful. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts.